you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, we're coming over there to get podcasts. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here. We certainly appreciate it. Make sure to uh, go to the youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss channel. You can uh, see there's over 4,100 videos over there you can watch and you can just that you can spend the rest of your life probably just watching those videos so uh not sure that i recommend it do it on the weekends or something so hit that bell notification button so you can do all the things we do over there also go to goodreads.com for just chris boss my new book beacons of leadership is coming out october 5th you can join the uh, goodreads giveaway and it's free you can maybe get a win a free book or something like that anyway you guys go to facebook linkedin twitter instagram tiktok all those places the cool kids are at, you just Google me or the Chris Voss Show, and you can see all the wonderful things we're doing there. Today, we have an amazing gentleman on the podcast. He's going to be telling us about his company, what he does, and how he does it in an amazing way, and telling us his founder story. So that's going to be interesting as well for those of you who want to grow up and be entrepreneurs. His name is Mr. Robert R. Wilson. He is the founder and chief executive officer of R2C Incorporated, an award-winning SDVOSB headquartered in Huntsville, Alabama. Robert provides strategic leadership and oversight for all aspects of the business, ensuring all laws, regulations, and other applicable obligations are observed wherever and whenever business is conducted on behalf of R2C Incorporated. Welcome to the show, Robert. How are you? Outstanding. How about yourself today, Chris? Awesome sauce. Welcome to the show. We certainly appreciate it. Give us your dot com so people can look you up on the interwebs. And can you explain to us what a SDVOSB is? So an SDVOSB is a service disabled veteran owned small business. And you can find us at R2C INC.com. There you go. There you go. So did, are you a veteran? Is that correct then? Yes, indeed. Uh, awesome sauce. 12 years all together in the U.S. Army, and happy to continue to support them and, and, and the great warriors and war fighters that we have out there. There you go. Thank you for your service, sir. Tell us about yourself. You've had the company for how many years now? You said, I think you said 12? Yeah, so we founded the company in uh, August of 2011, so we're right at the 10-year mark. Really started running stuff there in around 2013 and really started getting after it then. We've been incredibly blessed by by all accounts, and a lot of doors have opened up for us. So we've been, as I said, incredibly blessed. So there's no way I could have mapped this out 10 years ago, but it's it's been a phenomenal ride, and we look forward to a fabulous future. Now, this is awesome. You've uh, put in over 27, year experience, 27 years of experience in the aviation field. Give us your founder story that led up to you starting this company, and then we'll get into some of the details of what you do and how you do it. Absolutely. Ten years ago or so, I was working for the sixth largest defense contractor in the United States, a great company by its own right, but it's it was a very large company. And I was supporting a, a group here in Huntsville, Alabama. However, with most large organizations and large companies as such, and any large organization that you have, they, they're not really as agile as what some of the small businesses are. So we were uh, walking around out on out on the military installation and ran into some some old friends and we started talking a little bit and they they said hey we would love for you to do you know, these types of things and within this amount of time period and it was a time period where we really sure that we just couldn't react fast enough as a large business so the opportunity presented itself for uh, them to get funding to me through my business. And I sit down with the leadership from that entity, from my company, and talked everything through and then spoke with one of the other groups that were here on, on how we might be able to support them. Uh, I was given a huge amount of uh, support 
on both sides. And I was able to uh, step out of a very large entity of about 60,000 people into a small company of about two at the time. Now, I laugh and tell people if, I, if I'd have been real clever, RTC wouldn't have been the name. It would have been like Pegasus or some kind of stuff because we really are a unicorn. Yeah, you've heard about us, but you've never really seen us. We were a zero cost startup, which is incredibly odd in this. That is that is really unique to take and do, especially with the low overhead. Uh, what You said it makes you unicorn. In what ways are you guys really unicorn-like and special in your guys' uh, unique service that you... Uh... The whole concept of being a zero cost startup company in the, in the defense industry is, again... People have heard about it, but they've never really seen it. And you get to a point to where you're eating to hunt and, and you live and survive on, on the task order that you find today for the next couple of months. And then you go forward from there. Mm-hmm. And, and again, incredibly blessed we have been. It has been a trek one thing after another. So we started with a small series of task orders ranging from the first one, which was about $80,000, and then going on and we would get orders from $20,000 to, to 30 to 40, 100, until we really and truly received our first larger order, which was a little bit over. And that allowed us to grow and develop as a company as well. Prior and to you- that, everybody was just working out of wherever they could. Mm-hmm. So do you help? You I, There's some customers here that you have. I, I've heard of a couple of these. Let's see, the CIA, heard of them, the United mm-hmm. States Army, Corps of Engineers, the Department of the Army. Yeah, I've heard of these guys. The Department of the Air Force, Department of the Navy, Marine Corps, the Marine Simplify, Department of Transportation and Justice, and the U.S. Coast Guard. And it uh, looks like you've won a lot of awards as well. So are these largely your customers serving the U.S. government? Do you work in, in private industry at all? We are, we are 100% focused on, on federal business and federal government mm-hmm. uh, so we answer a lot of the a lot of the obsolescence needs for instance take the united states army the army has helicopters floating around that are over 70 years old obviously those helicopters aren't using the same technology as they did back in 1960 back in you know the 1950s they're having to be constantly and consistently updated and with every update that you have then you also have engineering diagrams that have to be updated you have maintenance logs and other things and books and so on and so forth that must be updated so that's really a niche for us and, and really how we got started and how we got off the ground quickly that's awesome. This is really cool. You guys won a lot of awards, Inc. 5000 for three years, Inc. Best Workplaces in 2018, Inc. Best Workplaces 2020 Honoree, Inc. 5000 in 2021, some city awards in 2021, lots of great awards that you guys have had in here. Congratulations. What do you attribute to your success in winning these awards and, of course, serving the military and our government? The ability to work together with our government is what's really important. It, it is, we've taken a group of folks and we formed, we, we formed a group of people and the company in and of itself. Right now we've got close to 100 people uh, that are working in six different states. But everyone has the same ideas and ideals where it comes to working together with our government customer. It is so important. So think of it from this perspective. We just went through the COVID pandemic and we're coming out the other side of it. And, and honestly speaking, there's been some great things that have happened there. We got to see we got to see what happens when the government and industry really work together, come around the table, identify what the problem is, and look for solution sets in order to find it. So we we went from hey, there's a pandemic, and hey, there's this dangerous stuff that's out here. We put the right people on the industry side together, the right people on the government side together. We get everybody around the table, and and we come up with with great ideas. And you came up with Moderna, Johnson, uh, and Pfizer all coming up with vaccines and the ability to then get those out to the populace and so on. Think about that. uh, That is a minor miracle. But when yeah. government and industry work together, a lot of things can happen and a lot of great things do. And that's precisely the approach that we take. We work from the industry side, work with our government customer to find those solution sets and find the answers to their problems. Once upon a time, somebody said, you know, almost any problem can be identified and a solution can be found if no one really is concerned about who gets the credit. And, and we're 100% all over that. That's awesome. That's awesome. What do you see the future of? I don't know if you guys were, if Afghanistan, the Afghanistan operation was something that kept you guys uh, had a lot of business coming in or what the future of of American defense is now that we've pulled out of Afghanistan. Do you see if, what type of future do you see the U.S. government being in the military, whether it's serving our local thing or we, of course, we have ships and everything around the world cruising around. What do you see the future of your business in in that field for? I, I, I think, Somebody recently said in the news that we 
we're we're facing you know no enemy and no ongoing conflicts right now for the first time in 29 years which may or may not be true i'm not 100 percent sure on that but, China. <laughs> excuse me yeah. sorry i had to cough there <laughs> But if I can't, but if I can tell you this, regardless of what anyone wants to say, the only way that we can continue to lead and continue to lead the world, and I would point out, the world is a much better place when we is that by having that strong defense and having a, a capable military that is standing and ready to go. That's just always been the case. It's not really a political thing. It's really more human nature than it is anything else. So when that deterrent is there and we can lead in the world, I think the world is a better and a safer place. And we at RTC play a small part in that by by making sure that the readiness and the sustainment of our soldiers, sailors, marine, and airmen are are there, and they can continue to, to use the items and the elements they need in order to persecute the mission and ensure that our way of life is protected. There you go. A good defense is a good offense. I think. Indeed, it's a... indeed. Now, it used to be said defense wins championships, right? So. Yeah, that's true. Is that still true? I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Uh, that I game, think it is in the NFL. Is that true? You guys are the is it Crimson Tide down there. Is that uh, acceptable to say on this channel? Yeah. So as far as the, as far as the collegiate <laughs> world goes, you know, you've got the Crimson Tide down here, and you've got the uh, Auburn Tigers. It's just typically one or the other for everybody in Alabama. The same. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not originally from here. So I'm I'm originally from Chicago, and I'm a Bears fan. Oh, Bears, the Bears, <laughs> the Bears. Yeah. Yeah, there you go, the Bears. I remember, I, I fortunately grew up in the Dicka days. What, what, what a coach, what a dude. So if we can get that guy back, I'm a Raiders fan I'm forever. Uh, yeah, yeah, the 70s, man, It's a, they were a good time. But there's a wild man on the sideline there, too. John Madden was <laughs> exactly known for common oh, temperate. That was just the age of great coaches. So what else do you want to touch on about your company you want people to know about and give people an opening eye? What, what's it been like? I, I'm kind of curious. What has it like been to take your company from just two people and scale it to the level it has? And that's quite the adventure. Yeah, it really has been. So really and truly, as far as our company structure goes, uh, RTC is RTC Inc. is a top-level corporation. We have three wholly owned subsidiaries underneath that. And each one of those companies actually target a separate area. So we have RTC Support Services, which is more of an aircraft maintenance type of company mm-hmm. uh, and, and really does on-site, on on military installation type of work to, to support to, to support the government mission. Then we have RTC Technical Solutions. Tech Solutions is more engineering and logistics type things that, that support program offices for acquisition so that, so that they have a professional element that's inside that can address the technical aspects of the programs as well as the um, as well as the mission platforms and so on. Mm-hmm. And then we have RTC Aerospace is our manufacturing company that also does high-end engineering and logistics. We do a lot of prototyping, a lot of fab stuff out of there. So we recently won, won an award for unmanned vehicles and some autonomous systems, which is kind of neat and from a technological standpoint. And then we've been able to do... Um, you know, a handful of things there that have been way cool in, in a lot of areas. The, Ameri- the, the, American, the American military is just, is just an extraordinary feat when it comes down to it, when you really think about how big it is. I've got a friend, that uh, a very good friend of mine, that I almost game with on a daily basis who's in, the uh, I believe, the Army, and he, he, he works on the manuals or something. And so he has to go out and work with private industry and prepare manuals for like, planes and different technical stuff like that. And he makes sure you know, the manuals explain everything. And there's just so much detail. They're complex. They, these, yeah, these these helicopters they put up and everything. It's, he, he tells me about some of it. I just go, holy freaking crap. That's like... Uh, and, like you know, again, I can't overemphasize. When you look at the... When, when you look at the bases, the base platforms, the base aircraft that are being used, and some of the, the, the vehicles that that we use, even on ground vehicles and things, and you look back at, and we've had those in the military inventory for 20, 25, 30 years on ground vehicles and on. You know, gosh, in the air vehicles, an aircraft is typically kept for 50 years. Uh, wow. that is There's new technology that, that is coming up every day. You've got new radios that have to be installed. You have you know, new gadgets, if you will, that show where this force is and that force is. You've got, you, you've got new weather radar that comes into play. You've, you've, you've got different code, code stuff for air traffic control and things of that nature. And all of those things have to get incorporated in order for those um, for those aircraft, for instance, to be able to, to fly and be able to perform in specific airspace. And then the communications aspect that goes along with it. 
and you think about it for an aircraft, for instance, everything that you do, every piece that you take on off of it or put on it, it has to be weighed and it has to be measured. And you have to ensure that everything there is in the right weight, the right balance to make sure that the aircraft will fly at its optimal. All of that takes some tedious work in order to do and to get right. And it's always changing. It's ever constant. So every time it seems like we go to a new to a new theater, for lack of a better term, when we went from Europe and then we went to uh, into the desert theaters and stuff. In in Europe, when you're coming down in a helicopter and you've got the the rotor wash and it's hitting the ground and so on, and it's blowing the trees and the grass is all over the place. It's not that big of a deal. But when you get into the desert and you start getting close to the ground, then you've got all the dust that comes up to the side of you and it, and, it, and it encircles you. And then the pilot can't see where the ground is. So yeah. all of a sudden you have some pretty hard landings and stuff and so on. So in, in order to counteract that, there's devices and sensors and so on that get put onto the aircraft so that it can overcome those things. Mm-hmm. With each sensor that goes on, all that weight and balance stuff has to be done. All of those books have to be updated. All those maintenance manuals have to be done, re- reworked and redone. Mm-hmm. And, in ev- and in all cases... You don't have contractors on the battlefield that can actually repair and maintain those pieces of equipment. In in some areas, you have to be able to teach the warfighter how to repair their own stuff. And, and mm. when, when that gets in, then you really have to get very detailed and very precise on, on what has to be done, how it has to be done in order for it to, to work. And I'll bet sand makes a great thing for machinery and hydraulics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I can't imagine. Yeah, you think about the size of the military and the logistics of what it takes to have the, all the different warships and naval officers, uh, military people all around the world, all the different ex- things that, that they're doing on any given day. When I lived in Vegas um, before COVID, we would have the, I lived up in the Northwest, and so we'd have the Nellis uh, Air Force Base, you know, the Raptors and stuff going overhead. And you just see the activity of, of the base in the flights that would go over and take place. It was just extraordinary. And you're just like, they're, they're busy. They're doing stuff. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, the, the, the more you sweat and train, the less you bleed in warfare, right? That's so, interesting. I never heard that. That's, that makes sense. It's, you, you've got to train and you've got to train to a, to a standard that, that allows you to be effective. And then you guys are, like we mentioned earlier, a certified service-disabled, veteran-owned small business. Do you guys mostly hire people that have come out of the military, or are, are they usually private citizens? Or how does- We have a huge veteran um, populace within our company. And while I won't say there's, there's a massive preference of veterans, we love the idea of having veterans working working in our company and working in positions that allow them to use that experience and leverage that experience and understanding of what our warfighters go through on a daily basis in order to improve our products uh, and our services and ultimately the lives of those warfighters that have come after them. It's, It's a big deal. It really is. Yeah, and I think it's an important deal. We've had people on the show in discussions about supporting veterans, and it, it's sad in this country that we there's a lot of veterans that fall through the the cracks and stuff. And you look at some people that end up in the homeless thing, and a lot of them are doing different things like housing or trying to support or retrain or help veterans. And it, it's so important that there's that sort of thing there. And I imagine the asset and the investment that we put into them in as, as U.S. government in having them work, be in the military, having them come out of it and then be able to advise and use that experience is, is just uh, completely invaluable. Yeah, and Chris, every veteran that's, every person who's ever went through basic training and then went on to to permanent party and, and lived a life in, inside the military, specifically on active duty, but even just during those short periods for reservists and for, for National Guardsmen, for instance, every single one of them has learned to come through adversity. And you start your first days in, in training and stuff, and you've got people in front of your face yelling and screaming at you. And what they're there for is there's reasons for that, and, and and it's there to to amp up the stress level because they want you they want the stress level to be very high because that's what combat is. So when you're in 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 a war zone or in an area where combat operations are going on, your stress level is higher, your heart beats faster, everything moves quicker, and you need to make decisions, and you need to make decisions very rapidly 
that affect the outcome of the mission and affect people's lives. So they want to induce that stress level so that you can learn and learn to handle it, learn to think, learn to make decisions under that stress uh, and so on. So that's huge just in and of itself. But there's some basic things too. Every one of those folks that comes through that type of training, what they really understand better than anything else is they understand how to get up, suit up, show up, and continue the mission. And that is huge. Mm-hmm. It really is. There's not another organization that, that we have in, in the United States of America that that teaches and stresses those simple things plus the leadership and the ability to follow orders and follow rules and so on as much as what the U.S. military does. It's a phenomenal yeah. institution. And I think a lot of our community doesn't give them as much value. I, I feel sometimes like they do. I think in military communities, they understand the value and, and what it does. But I think sometimes people are a little bit dismissive of not necessarily the military, but what the U.S. government does. Oh, those uh, big government. Whatever. Yeah. And they don't really realize how important it is and, and how valuable it is to our country, the safety of it, the security. Like a lot of people take their security for granted. They're like, I don't know, nothing's going on right now. No one's bombing us. We're, I drive down the road and do my job every day. But it, it's because of that defense posture. One of the things that was interesting to me that I didn't know about when I was doing the research for my uh, book on leadership, I was writing a lot of my stories about leadership and experiences being self-employed. And my friends in the military turn me on to the concept of uh, what's called in the military, I guess, be, no, do, the be, no, do model of leadership. Mm -hmm. And I got into that and really in depth. And one of the things I talked about in my book was this ability to be the type of leader that can inspire people to move mountains, to go to the next level. And I really started getting into the depth of what the military does, where you follow leadership in the military to a point that your life is on the line and you're willing to give that for your country and freedom and the rest of us that that uh, sit around eating Cheetos all day watching TV. And the extraordinary amount of leadership and inspiration that goes into that is quite, is quite amazing. And I'll probably be writing in some future books or documenting some future manuals, the Be No Do concept. But I was really blown away by just, I, it turned into like a whole thing that I just got into how the military works. And it, it's quite extraordinary. It is indeed. Uh, again, leadership is stress from the very first days that you get in. You get to see up close what a lot of that is. And you develop relationships and bonds through military service that it's impossible to actually sit here and describe to someone who's never really and truly had the, the opportunity or had the blessing to, to go through that. Those bonds that, that, that become developed when you place your life in someone's hands and they place theirs in yours, there's there, there's nothing like that. There really isn't. There's nothing else in the world like that. And, and that's a bond that, that once you have it, you know, and you might not see each other for seven, ten years, and the next time you do, you pick it right up, and it's 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 incredible. It really and, is. And I've had friends that have struggled when they come home from tours of duty. They've struggled because they miss that bond, the brotherhood, that having someone know your back, even though they're in the firing line of danger. But just having that brotherhood, and that they'll tell me that, that I really miss that. So it's good that they they're business like you that can support them and help them and employ them possibly, so that they they can still be in that field or family or brotherhood uh, that they had in their military. Yeah. The other thing that the other thing that the military gives in, in, in a lot of ways, and, and this is one of those one of those transition elements that, honestly speaking, we've just got to get a little bit better at. Right now, right now in the United States, we're over one veteran committing suicide every day, and, and that's that's a horrible concept in and of itself. But knowing and understanding that these folks have went through so much, defended us, defended our country, our way of life. And given so much and then come back and, and can't find a way to to translate that experience and those experiences to a fulfilling life, is it, it's it, it's a horrible thing. So we, we need to strive on how to help them transition and how to make that transition a little bit better. Now, I think a lot of it comes from you're given so much responsibility when you're in the military. Yeah. Um, at such a young age and, and at such the even the low levels, even into... Uh, it's not uncommon for a 19, 20 year old um, young soldier to have millions, have responsibility for millions of dollars worth of equipment. That really is not unheard of at all. 
fact, it's quite commonplace. The, you're seeing soldiers and, and sailors get out at, at 22 to 26 years old, and, and all of a sudden they're going back in a society where they don't have that, that opportunity for that responsibility, and they just don't have the opportunities that open back up to them. And it's, quite frankly, it's a terrible thing. Uh, a lot of them need to lose faith very rapidly. So. I would agree. And as I got into this whole section of the Be No Do and leadership concept uh, that's taught in the military, a, a lot of these, a lot of people that are in the military are taught to be leaders. Like you say, they're, they're in the resources that they have availability to them uh, when they come into civilian life is these people are leaders. They trained under this thing. They know how to work together, team building. I have so many different, if when I, with all my companies, especially when we had very large companies with 100 plus people, team building was the hardest thing. You're getting people to get along, <laughs> build teams and work together. Yeah, Bob yeah. does this and Joe does that. And you're just like, oh my God. And I think from one of the studies we saw or one of the conversations we had, the research, people that come out of the military are great for teams. They're great for leadership. They understand concepts. They understand working hard. I, one of my friends who's at the gym, he's training right now for, what is it, the Ranger program? Or no, Green Beret program. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so he's at the gym with his 60-pound rug, 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 rugger pack. Uh, what is it called? Rug, rug pack. And he's in the morning, he's uh, up hiking with it. And uh, the training that they have is is far different than some guy who just, uh, I don't know, pushes papers and pencils around here like I do. And but honestly speaking, that's the physical side of it. The mental side is is where what really gets a whole lot of people. Mm-hmm. Again, specifically special forces and ranger school are, are similar in, in some ways. A ranger school is going to take someone and they're going to, in essence, wipe them out you know, physically, and then ask them to do different squad level orientation tasks and stuff and so on and so forth. And to make decisions that, again, this is a training that specifically tries to mirror as close as possible because there's no way to to truly mirror combat, but amp up the stress level to a very high degree and then make sure that you make decisions. And it's not just the decisions of the leader, it's the decisions of the followers as well. And there's a trust element that's there. When special forces, your special forces training is is a little bit different as well. In the very beginning, they're going to really push you hard physically and stuff and so on and so forth. But then on the other side of that, there's a mental aspect of that. There's foreign languages that get taught and everything else and so on that also become part of what's there as as far as your basic stuff goes. And then but there's all the explosives you got to learn, the weapons, the medical aspects, and everything else. That's the conversation I usually have with them. I'm like, and that sounds like a lot of physical work. And he goes, no, Chris, a lot of it's mental. Like a lot of it's in the head. And to have that ability, the endurance, and the thought process, to me, that's just, th- those make great employees. So why wouldn't you want to have them? I think there was a study or something we came across that the military folks uh, that have come out of the services are, are just great employees. And you find a lot of them in lead. That was what it was. You find a lot of them in leadership positions using the government or running their own companies like yourself, but they're really prime for leadership. And so much of corporate America or private industry is looking for leaders. And they're really, I think, maybe an untapped source. Oh, I agree with you hundred percent. I have said that you know, if there's anything if there's anything that comes out of 29 years of warfare within our country and, and our country, quote unquote, being a war, think about one of the greatest things. And one of the greatest things are, are the men and women who come out of the, the U.S. forces. And again, those the development of, of those people and doesn't matter at, at what rank structure. Those people all transition into the civilian workforce at some level at some time, whether it's entrepreneurs or employees or whatever. Some of them that, that go back in and support the U.S. government again as, as DOD civilians or something along those lines. But again, it's it's incredible. It's an incredible source. And as you said, a, a wealth of knowledge and experience that it, it's something that everyone should look to tap into. Definitely. So what do you see the future of you and your company doing here as, as we We're poised right now to really to make a quantum leap. We have we've worked really hard for the past eight years to to put us in a position to where to where we can grow and grow rapidly. And don't misunderstand what I mean. We have been again incredibly blessed. I know I keep continuing to say that, but we really have been. And we've so 
we've been on the Inc. 5000, America's fastest growing companies for you know, five consecutive years, which is a phenomenal feat in and of itself, which only 2% of the companies that ever show up on the Inc. 5000 ever make. But having said that, we're in an area right now where, where we can potentially look at triple digit growth over the course of, of the next uh, two, three years. And we're very excited about it. So we're right around 100 people right now. And we think we could be as, as much as 1,000 people within the next 36 to 48 months, which obviously is an incredible amount of growth. And so we're excited about it. We're poised. We've, you know, we've scaled the staff and so on to where we need to be. And we're looking forward to make that quantum leap. And, and again, I can't say enough for the people that, that, that surround me. You know, there's no one who leads a company that will, will sit down and tell you, hey, it's all me. And, and if they do, then you probably need to get away from them real fast because they're either delusional or they're lying to you. You don't really want to do business with either. So the folks that, that I have around from my CFO to my vice presidents, human resources, contracts, forth business development. They are an extraordinary group of people. We've had the uh, opportunity to bring folks into some areas. Just on my personal staff, I have I have five people who have owned their own businesses, which is practically unheard of for anybody in my, at, at, at our size of a company in, in order to have that expertise in, in those areas. And then again, our people are, are really and truly what make the difference. They mm-hmm. They are all about taking care of the taking care of the the mission and making sure that it gets done so that they can support America's warfighters wherever they're found in the world. And that's huge. It's attitude that sets the altitude, and we have been put in a place to where we can really soar. I'm gonna write that down. Attitude that sets the altitude. I love that. That's the first time I've heard that. That's brilliant. Any other tips you want to share for entrepreneurs or people to be successful in business before we go out? From my aspect, at any given point that you're willing to put yourself out there and you're willing to do the hard work necessary, and I really and truly mean that, the hours are long and it's about choice. And and we have those choices. We're so incredibly fortunate and blessed in this country to have those choices. It doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, what you do there is an avenue for you to get wherever you truly want to go in this country. That's one of the great blessings of of the United States of America. And that's why we continue to have so many people that want to come here as opposed to our people wanting to go elsewhere. You have the ability to do it, but it's a series of decisions that you have to make. So you have to continue to learn. You have to continue to seek knowledge. You have to continue to, to grow and build and serve. And it's all about serving. Um, it's it's easy to say, hey, you're the leader and so on, but what you have to understand from the leadership perspective is you're really serving those people who work, quote unquote, for you, because ultimately you'll find that you're really working for them. And once you've found that's a beautiful thing, find it, understand it, continue to thrive in it. Do the things that you want to do and outsource hate. You know, those things that you don't like to do them. There's someone else that loves to do them, outsource that stuff. So you don't have to do it and you don't have to concentrate on it and you can concentrate on the things that you love to do. That's so true. That's wise work. I love being the visionary of my company. I love being the captain of the ship and being the guy, the guy that at the end you've got to make it work. And, but I, some of the detail work, I hate some of the redundancy. I hate, it just doesn't, I'm a visionary and it doesn't work for me. So no, yeah, outsourcing that to other people is important. Ab- yeah. Absolutely. I fully understand. We, we have so many regulations when we're doing federal government type of work that we have to comply with and that we have to ensure that it's, it's very precise. So when we first started out and, and they said, all right, what accounting system are you using? I said, man, that's something I really don't want to mess with. So I went out and I found a CPA and, and I found someone who set up our books and set everything up for us and so on. And I outsourced that to that organization. And let me tell you, it has been the greatest blessing ever that I didn't have to mess with that. Because if, if that was the case, I probably would have went broke the first month. It, it's just 
man, you know, you're working, you're working two jobs anyway in the beginning of this stuff because you have to go out and you have to talk to your customers, you have to meet meet other people, you have to do marketing, you have to do all of that, and then once you get through with all of it, then you go home after you've worked that for ten hours, you go home and then you work the next eight hours just to figure out how to compile all of that, bring it all together, and put it into something that that is actually your deliverable. It is huge. You you get through those 16, 18 hour days, and that's one thing, and then you have to go in and do all those other things that you hate. Let me tell you, it will drag on you fast. So outsource the hate, outsource it early, get rid of it, and get it out of your life. Because it's not outsource fun. the hate, I love it. That should be a t-shirt. So there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. If you hate done, you probably don't need it. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Do what you love, get rid of that other junk, and, and then move forward. And the other thing that I would say as far as you know, advice, keep calm and carry on because most things do work out and they do work out for the best. As life shoots those torpedoes at you and takes those shots at you, slow down a little bit and, and learn to go slow so that you can go fast. I know it starts sounding like some character from Cars and stuff. Seriously, yeah, you got to slow down just a little yeah. bit so you can really speed up. Keep calm and carry on. Isn't that a Churchill uh, British thing from World War II? There's a reason for these axioms, especially in the military. Yeah. They work. Absolutely. When the bullets start flying, just remember to duck. <laughs> Ducking is important from time to time. You don't always need to be sticking your head out there. That's, That's for sure. Absolutely. Well, it's been wonderful and insightful, Robert, to sh- share your company with us and uh, your knowledge and experience and everything else. As we go out, give us your plug so people can look you guys up, find out more about you on the internet. Again, we are at r2c-inc.com, and uh, we support America's warfighter around the world. There you go. And thank you for your service. You've been a wonderful guest and very intriguing. Thank you so much for having us. I can't say thank you much. Uh, Thank you, Robert. With what you do, so keep it up, and uh, we'll be looking for that book. All right. Sounds good, Robert. Thank you very much, sir, and thanks to my audience for tuning in. Go to YouTube.com, for Chess Chris Foss. Hit the bell notification button. You can go to Goodreads.com, for Chess Chris Foss. See everything we're reading and reviewing in our book over there. And also go to TikTok, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. There's like a billion groups that we have at the show that you can go see and uh, involve with some of the communities we have there. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other, and we'll see you guys next time.